Welcome to Discovery Days and Health Sciences here virtually, um, but hosted in partnership with the University of Calgary. The Canadian Medical Hall of Fame, I mean, built into our name is probably a pretty good understanding of what we do. We uh, recognize and celebrate Canadian heroes whose work advances health in Canada and in the world. That's what this Hall of Fame does. We call out excellence among some really great leaders in, health, in the health sciences in our country. Um, and we also hold programs like this to engage youth and inspire you to careers in the health sciences. So the Discovery Day program is one of the things we do to get you excited about, um, about what you might be able to do in the health sciences. If you're going to work in the sciences, we hope you're going to choose the health sciences. So you will also see videos on our own website. So a local um, laureate is Dr. Bill Cochran. Um, he has passed away quite some time ago, but he was the founder of the medical school that is hosting this event today. There's 149 laureates in the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame now. Um, and if you're having a, a tough day, we really encourage you to um, visit our website and check out their tribute videos. Um, they really are, I hope, a sense of inspiration and, uh, and positivity for what Canadians are doing to lead in health here and in the world. One of our other programs is also something called the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame Award. This is an award for second year medical students. And um, on the slide in front of you is the list of um, University of Calgary students who won it in the past. So if you eventually find yourself in med school, if that's your path, maybe there'll be a different version of health sciences that you're interested in, but this may be a award that you could apply for. So I'm going to Dr. Mettings. Um, he is the Dean of the Cummings School of Medicine. And I'd like to welcome everybody virtually to the Cummings School of Medicine. And I am, I can't tell you how excited I am to to see all of you virtually with an interest in health sciences. And health sciences, I think you're going to learn, is a tremendous opportunity for all of you. It doesn't seem like that long ago, although it is, that I was in high school and had no idea that I was going to end up in medicine. It actually wasn't on my plans at the time. And one of the things that I think you're going to find is the tremendous variety of careers and opportunities that are available to almost anybody in health sciences. So listen up to people, get a chance to chat to everybody and 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 welcome. So I think you've got, I think, I, this, I, if we can just put up the territorial acknowledgement, because I think it's important here. Yes, I did do it when you were um, okay. trying to get back on and uh, I can put it on one more okay. time. So, so one of the things that I think is really critically important about all of this is that in science, and today we're talking about science and medical science, is that we always build upon, we stand on the shoulders of people who have come before us. And one of the joys of science and one of the reasons it works is that it continuously builds by increasing knowledge. Sometimes we take little roots that are wrong, we, it is rapidly self-correcting and we come back again. And so one of the important parts of all of this is to acknowledge the people that have come before us in oh so many ways. One of the important groups of people are the people that have in, in, inhabited the land that we're on today before we did. And so when I say welcome to the University of Calgary, I also want you to think a little bit about acknowledging the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprised of Siksika, Pekani, and the Kainai First Nations, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, which includes the Shiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. And the city of Calgary, we're very proud to say, is also home to Métis Nation, uh, Region 3 of Alberta. And so it's my pleasure to introduce today our speaker and somebody I think that you're going to learn an awful lot from. It's somebody we are incredibly fortunate to have in the coming School of Medicine, and that's Dr. Lindsay Crowshoe. Now, Lindsay is is a Blackfoot primary care physician. He is also a clinician scientist, somebody who does both cl clinical medicine and studies science. He's an associate professor in our Department of Family Medicine, and he's an assistant dean of Indigenous Health. Lindsay holds 
grant funding from what is called CIHR, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, which is highly competitive of grant funding. And he has that because he is an expert in bringing together provincial, national, and international research teams that focus on primary care, public health, and health education. He's a leader in Indigenous primary health care services, systems, and policy. And he provides input not just to us in the coming School of Medicine, but also into provincial and national dialogues about Indigenous care. So Lindsay is an amazing family physician. He is somebody we are so lucky to have. And Lindsay, I'm happy to turn this over to you now. Thank you, Dr. Mettings. Lindsay, we'll need you to put your camera back on. Fantastic. Still, I'm um, still sorting through the, uh, the different locations of the buttons. And thank you, Dr. Yeah. Mettings, for the introduction. I really appreciate that. And thank you for speaking and sharing the uh, land acknowledgement. That, um, that is really important for me. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to be able to chat with you, you guys today. And um, I can uh, jump into my talk. I, I was asking my daughter, like, what, what a what would a high school student really want to hear from a guy like me? And uh, she told me a whole bunch of things that uh, probably I shouldn't say. <laughs> and then I said, I'll, I'll just share a whole bunch of baby pictures of her since she's in high school at the moment. Um, but, uh, and then I said, well, maybe I'll talk about um, the point in my life where it really happened. And she said, yeah, let's, I'll do that. So I'll have to share with you some stories. Um, and stories are the things that, uh, that we uh, have to make sense of in our life. And once you see my slide pre uh, presentation, um, you'll see um, why I, I based this story in uh, resistance and reconnection. Um, I'm, a, I'm an indigenous person, as, uh, as you were made aware. Um, I'm from one of the Blackfoot communities, as Dr. Meddings has mentioned. It's one of the three Blackfoot tribes in Southern Alberta. I guess, um, I, I, I often do uh, pop quizzes for students and, uh, and always get them on, on this. I say, hey, uh, I'm in Treaty 7. There are three, treaty, three treaties in Alberta, you know, 6, 7, and 8. And I'm uh, from the Pigani Nation and uh, one of the three Blackfoot tribes. And my grandma's from Satena, which is right, right next door to us um, on the edge of Calgary. And so, and um, I've worked uh, some, uh, some of my life at the, uh, at the Eden Valley, which is one of the offshoot tribes of the Stony Nakoda, which has um, three, three tribes connected to that. Um, so in Southern Alberta, if you count those up, um, how, many, uh, how many reserves uh, um, do you think we have in, in Alberta? And, and I put up a slide and it shows, you know, 10 um 15 20 so like three tri three treaty zones and and the answer is like like 160 some right there are 160 reserves in alberta and that's diversity that's like all unique nations all unique peoples all living in these communities that are like blessed and connected and you know challenged and all that kind of stuff um, but that's where i come from the the idea that indigenous peoples are all the same is a huge myth and something we have to make some sense of, um, you know, 62 language groups within within Canada itself. Um, and what does that mean? And what draws us together as a nation um, of Indigenous people? So I'll, I'll talk about my story and, and how um, my, my background of being an Indigenous person is really like critical to to my pathway to be a doctor, which is a is a it's a really important thing in my life, of course, right? Um, I didn't think I'd come to this, this place. It was a, a long journey. Um, and it was a journey that I title uh, Resistance and Reconnection. And you'll see two, two pictures on this slide. And take a close look at those two slides because they're made by two very different, um, different photographers at the very same point in, 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 uh, in North America. You see on the left there an individual a uh, group of individuals, warriors, looking over the prairies, right? A host of uh, things that you might have heard as stereotypes of Indigenous peoples or as things that we might think is, is, is like one of the few truths of Indigenous peoples. And the, the issue is that it is not necessarily. Um, war and all that kind of stuff is, uh, seems to be a, uh, 
a, a, a bit of a fabrication. I mean, although we all, all nations across the world fought each other for land and territory and all that kind of stuff. There's this myth that uh, our culture was all this warrior culture, but it is, uh, it is mostly not. Um, we are a group of people that had to learn to understand each other and ha develop big philosophies of relationships. And if you look on the uh, picture on the right, you see people holding each other. And uh, that was a picture by a totally different, different photographer at the time who saw, and he was from our community, he was an indigenous person coming to indigenous peoples that the very same person on the left came to and fabricated many of his pictures in the 1800s and uh, showed what was really happening. And this is um, people coming together at a dance. This is called the owl dance and where we'd laugh and come and, and, uh, and enjoy each other and build big relationships with each other. And that was my experience of being an Indigenous person is, is the laughing and the gathering. Can I have my next slide, please? Uh, those are the two individuals um, that, uh, that, uh, that, um, that these photographs came from. Curtis was, uh, if, you, you, if you look at any, uh, Google any you know, historical Indigenous pictures, you'll see Curtis's work. He's had hundreds, thousands of of pictures that the, the the problem is he would often fabricate these pictures he would bring um bring items of clothing from different tribes in order to elaborate and make things look better than they actually were or, uh, so he created a whole host of myths because the idea that ind indigenous peoples were were uh, were were a vanishing race and and he wanted to capitalize on that and sell his book at the same time um, while Thursell, who was actually um uh from uh uh, indigenous communities, Park Creek, and uh, he lived and went to many of the same communities that Curtis went to at the very same time, shooting very different pictures, right? Pictures of people laughing, gathering, um, a lot of satire, um, and that's 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 the reality of it all. Um, the stories that we make. Can I see the next slide, please? The stories of resistance is what I uh, I, I I I would like for you to key into. Uh, Gerald Visner is an indigenous uh, uh, academic uh, in the arts who who speaks to this idea of survivance. Um, you may have heard of a, a lot of things, like I said, about indigenous peoples around stereotypes and poverty and all that all that stuff that that I have to challenge and push against and ask my kids and family and community to challenge and push against. Even though in the in the context of it, there's a history of colonization that has created a whole host of social traumas, that have created um, uh, uh, a disconnection and uh, a lack of resources in our in our communities that make it hard for us. Um, but it's in this uh, togetherness, this this understanding, this story, this uh, this this resistance to it, and and saying, you know, it's okay. We'll learn from it, and we'll make a change. And we won't be pigeonholed into this into this tragedy. Tragedy. So, um, th this uh, this this presentation is all about that. Um, how we make sense of the of the uh, the cards we're dealt, whether they're they're like difficult ones or are amazing ones. But how do we make sense of the stories and the people and the connections that are all part of this that make us who we are today? And so, um, I'll tell you my story. Oh, well, a bit of it. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So you see that um, I, I put up the slide of where I'm from. The, uh, I'm, one of the, I'm from one of the Blackfoot tribes, as I mentioned, Pigani. My mom is from actually Siksika. My dad's from the Pigani Nation. My tribe was cut in half, um, the, uh, the Pigani, uh, so a big chunk of it's in, in Montana. Um, and this was our traditional areas. And um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, part, of, part of a way, uh, when, when indigenous people come together uh, for the first time, we actually have to share, it's part of our protocol of sharing who we are to show our connections. Um, the, the way that we connect with each other is to lay out a landscape of interconnections of people and places to say, this is who I am. It's just not me as an individual because we're very collective as a group. And we have to show where we are, are situated within that collection. Um, these are my parents getting married. And uh, I come from a family of eight kids. I'm the seventh youngest. Um, you don't even see me in this picture, um, but um, we uh, we lived uh, very young on uh, on a farm on on the reserve uh, in my community. 
until we moved off and uh, the work was, uh, the life was, uh, was very much rural um, until I get, like I say, I, I moved off, but I'll tell you more about that story. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, from my uh, father's side, I come from a, a background of, of a spiritual leaders. Um, brings down the sun, uh, if you were to read, read about him, was a spiritual leader at the time of the most change within Southern Alberta. Um, Southern Alberta changed with the coming of um, the settlers and during the phases of colonization. Um, Alberta was like relatively un, un, untouched um, until the 1800s. Uh, we actually have accounts and records of when the settlers first came, they were whiskey traders and fur traders, and they brought in a host of, of craziness, right? With, um, with, a, with the only commodity to be traded was, was whiskey for the buffalo hides that we had. And it, it devastated our communities and brings down the sun as a ceremonial and spiritual leader was one of those individuals that helped us to stay together as a community. Um, my, my great grandmother, as you can see, is the next individual up in the middle is her name was Laura Buffalo. She was a um, spiritual leader as well, a, a holy woman. Um, medicine woman, and she would name us all when we were, we were born. So I have a traditional name. You might have seen um, Dr. My, my name list is Lyndon. Um, Dr. Meddings called me Lindsay. Um, uh, and that, that's, that's a, a story unto itself because a, a nurse, um, my parents named me Lindsay, but the nurse must have misheard or maybe she didn't like it, but she wrote down Lyndon on the birth certificate, never changed it because it's, a, it's an administrative step that I never had time or didn't want to bother. So I, I go by both names, um, one's legally, one's, uh, one's um, with everybody else. Um, but when I go into traditional uh, communities and ceremonies, they call me by my uh, traditional name, uh, Sautki Sapistu, which means Prairie Owl. Down below, um, Mrs. Buffalo, you'll see uh, two individuals. Those are my grandparents from my mom's side, uh, Siksika Nation, and they were, uh, my grandfather was chief of Siksika for, for decades and uh, a politician fighting for indigenous rights in Alberta and across Canada. And uh, the, he was the, the head of the, uh, the Horn Society, which is a, a very traditional spiritual society in, in the Blackfoot community. And my uh, grandma was his partner in that, uh, originally from Satana. Um, but she was also the head of the Moto Kiks, which is a Buffalo Women's Society. So I grew up connecting to a lot of spirituality. My, my, my dad's parents in this right picture, my grandma, she didn't even speak English. She was a fully 100% Blackfoot speaker, and uh, and it was always a challenge to make sense of through my mom what what how to communicate with with my grandparents um, from the from Pagani Nation. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so, but um, things I don't know if you've seen this picture, and I don't don't know if you've heard much about the history of residential schools. Um, it seems that Canada now has the um, has come to a, a bigger awareness of this. These are things that are realities and truths that um, from the truth and reconciliation that we have to make sense of and how uh, <laughs> uh, I, I just thanks. Uh, um, Mr. McLean, I see that see your note there as well. The nurse spelt your name wrong as well. It, it happens, I guess. Um, take a look at this. This is a, a, a done by an indigenous artist. And I find that um, art spells and tells stories that that are dramatic and major. And if you can look closely, you can see the a moment in time when um, indigenous kids were taken away and brought to these uh, state run, church run uh, residential schools because it was the law. You could not, could not stay with your parents, right? My, um, in my family, my mom went, my grandma went, there's, you know, my oldest siblings had to go to residential schools, but by the time I, uh, I was of age, they had started to shut down. Does anybody know when the last residential school uh, finished, was closed down? Just put it in the chat if you do. You can Google it so you can share. Yeah, 1996. And uh, I know that, um, ask your parents what they were doing in 1996. In 1996, I was uh, uh, in training still. I was a, I was a, <clears throat> as a family medicine resident, not a resident of a residential school. Um, but the last um, residential school closed when I was still in medical training. That's um, for me. That's not that long ago. So 
these are things that are realities. And the tragedies and the traumas and the disconnections were the things that my, um, my parents and my grandparents uh, experienced and um, not super willing to share what these stories were. So it's only been lately that um, there's been a lot of sharing and understanding and all across the board, because these are things that our parents were protecting us from. Um, but it sets the stage for, for the life that, that I had. My mom was, was always trying to find a better life and she left the reserve and my dad uh, because of abuse and a whole host of things and raised us as a single mom. And we moved a lot. We moved to the city when I was like really little and uh, life was hard. There was like um, a lot of poverty, uh, it's often um, not enough money to pay the rent, not enough money to pay the bills, uh, living with a host of food. I was like, I was hungry. Uh, the um, electricity being shut off um, regularly because of the bills. And my mom was always seeking something better and looking for something better. So we moved a lot, uh, man. And uh, like probably like three times in grade five, six, seven, eight. And finally I got tired of it and eventually moved out, which is part of the story. Can I have the next slide? Um, I was, I was, I was, uh, couldn't find a picture of me um, because it was in this moment when I had this huge black eye that I thought there's got to be something better, right? Because I was living a, a difficult life, um, things were hard, and um, and I was running with a, not a great crowd. <laughs> the kids, my friends, were um, pretty uh, rebellious and didn't want to go to school, and and there there's lots of fighting and you know, substances. And I, I could see myself <clears throat> living that life because I saw other siblings and family members living that life. And I was like, I don't really like it. I don't, I don't like, uh, I don't like this, uh, this type of living. Um, I, I think I, I think I can do something better than that. And I, I explicitly made a change. <laughs> and like, I think I will start working in school because uh, it seems to connect with me, like learning and doing this work, even though all of my friends were like, no, I don't do that. Let's skip out. Let's do something else. Let's, um, let's just be bad kids. And uh, I was a bad kid. And um, so I made a change. And so grade nine starts and it's like awesome. And I'm like working hard. And the, the, the teachers are saying, man, Lindsay, why you're, you're doing so, so, so amazingly now, uh, what's really going on? And I said, you know, I, I think I can do stuff like this. And um, I, I start feeling pretty good about it. I joined the math club of all things and, and found out I, I had some abilities. I, I started writing math tests and international math tests and found like, wow, I, I was doing really well scoring higher than any of the teachers in our school, that's for sure. And um, so I'll tell you a few stories around this stuff. Um, and it all starts with this, even though, no, stay back there. Even though I, uh, I was working hard, I, I joined the basketball team. I was super uncoordinated because I've never really played sports in my life, but I was kind of fast. I can, I can run. I was really tall, right? I'm like 6'4", and I was 6'4", at that time, but skinny as a beanpole and totally uncoordinated. Um, but I was like trying to make sense of it. Um, I got a girlfriend and it was pretty awesome. Unfortunately, she recently broke up with their boyfriend who was like three years older than her. He was in, he was in grade 12. And, and um, one day he, uh, he uh, saw me at this arcade and he said, I want to fight you, Lindsay, because you took my girlfriend. And I said, okay. I was not one to ever back down from, from a fight. I was like, learn that from my, my mom, my, my family to, to never back down. And I recognized I really had no skills um, and he totally beat me up, right? And I had this huge back eye and my mom was really angry. And then I went to school and um, lo and behold, the, the teachers are like, oh, I was already in line for a student of the month. And I won the student of the month and and uh, I had this big black eye and it was on a poster, a huge poster on the wall. And I go up there on the stage and I come back down to my friends who are all like, you know, still living that same sort of chaotic life. And they looked at me and they said, Lindsay said, you're not really like us. You, you could be a something, anything. You could be a doctor. And that was my friend Francine who said that. And I recognized, wow, maybe I could grade nine. And uh, that became my spark because other people started seeing in me the things that I think I was starting to see and um, wasn't so super confident in it, but recognized that, yeah, maybe I could. So grade nine and a black eye and the student of the month award for January um, 1993, I think it was, 94. 
yeah, student a month for uh, of 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 the school, Sir Wilfrid Laurier in in uh, in uh, East Side of Calgary, uh, was the moment in time where I said, I think I could do this, and it became my goal. Um, can I have the next slide? And uh, the next slide is shows a bike, and uh, I'll talk about some of the things that were really helpful in my journey, um, which you might find interesting. Uh, maybe funny, but there's a point to these stories. And this is an old bike. Like I say, we had nothing. I, I was uh, in junior high, one of my uh, older siblings, he was married and his wife gave me her old bike, but it didn't work. And it was this bike, it was a Sakini, probably from the 70s. And so I like, like, yeah, thanks, but it doesn't work. And they said, well, maybe you can fix it up. And I and they knew that I was inclined to take things apart because I was super curious about everything because I was like this annoying kid that would like ask people a bazillion questions and and not stop, right? I was just like so curious and I would like exhaust people around me, they said, because I would ask people and I would keep asking and finding out their knowledge and then ask beyond it. And they would be like, okay, enough, Lindsay. Just like figure it out yourself. And I said, sure. Um, and, and that was my challenge in life was to like, figure things out. So I, I started to understand and learn and pick things apart. And um, as a, I think it's a, a trait that's important in all of our lives, just to, to not be satisfied with what's there and to like make sense of it. So I took apart this bike many times, learned how to like fix axle bearings and uh, brakes and all that kind of stuff. And um, for me, when I think about the things that make me well, that make me connected is, it, I always come back to a bike. I know there's this philosopher named Sam who talks about quality of life and he talks about this capabilities concept where the things that you, that you to be and to do that make you well in life. And these are things, things that I, I would pass on to you. What are the things in your life that make you, that you do and that you are that make you well? For me, riding a bike and learning how to make bikes is one of those. So. Um, I, I do a lot of that stuff still right now. Like all last year, I was building bikes, you know, in the back here, this is my basement um, for, for friends. I made a whole bunch of fat bikes that I turned them into e-bikes and learned how to like, you know, do all that stuff at the same time, because it's really important to like have these spaces to make sense of it. I was one of those kids that I would just take apart anything and half the time I couldn't fix it. I was just like, oh, that was interesting. I'll move along, but this is something that, that made me well. Yeah, stay on the next slide. <laughs> so this is all about black eyes and bicycles and now goofy looking guitars. <laughs> um, when I was young, and this is, this is really important for me, the things, like I say, from a capabilities perspective, the things to do and to be that make me well, music is one of those things. It was, it was like what kept me together, right? In the face of chaos, as I was describing it, um, the guitar was the thing that really, really helped me a lot. Um, my brother brought home a guitar. Um, one of my brothers, I have a few brothers, and uh, he wanted to learn it. I really like, had no idea about it. I really wanted to play piano, but you know, we had no funds to buy a piano. And so uh, I said, hey, can I learn too, Gary? And he said, sure. And, and I learned, and I learned really fast. Uh, once in a while, my mom would have some cash and she'd send me to some lessons and I learned a bit here and there. Um, I would, I would, within a few months, I would surpass the knowledge of what the teacher could teach me. And he would say, move along to another teacher, please. But we would have no money. So I mostly self-taught. And uh, um, I learned that the, um, the, the way that when you play music, you can really integrate oneself. Um, thinking about now, when I see people who, uh, who have a lot of troubles and chaos and they kind of, it's called flipping your lid, you, you decompensate and, and then you do things to make sense of that. And it's really tr uh, troublesome, but if you can like mindfulness, reconnect things, I think building bikes helps me to be mindful and reconnect so that I can make sense of the world and make sense of the knowledge that I'm learning so that school is, is, accept, is, is achievable. Um, playing guitar was one of those things, playing guitar, learning technique, playing a song, writing songs, learning to sing, all that good stuff. Um, so this is a guitar that I bought when I was in grade, grade 10. And um, I, uh, I uh, had moved out from my mom's house um, by grade nine because I was tired of the chaos. And, uh, and one of my other brothers said, hey, Lindsay, do you wanna, do you wanna come live with me? And my mom was happy to do so because she saw, you know, I got this black eye and I was getting into fights and all this kind of stuff, even though I knew I was trying to make, I was trying to change as a person, but she was afraid for me. And so she sent me to live with my brother and it was great and it was stable. There's always food on the table and all that good stuff. 
and uh, I got summer jobs and I was working working <laughs> in uh, I don't know in the old days there used to be more magazines and so I worked in a magazine a place that would distribute magazines so uh, I made some you know save money and I said I want to buy a guitar and I went to a guitar shop and like there's also all these cool guitars and like I saw this flying V guitar <laughs> I was like the, in retrospect it's kind of like it's a cool guitar but it's really hard to play and it's kind of goofy at the same time but I just like this glowed and it was like oh it was awesome so this is a 1985 court flying V at like a dive bomb tremolo system like Eddie Van Halen and and like and it was super awesome but also hard to play <laughs> But music has been always a part of my life. I play in bands. I, my kids play music. I, I come, I, I, I've traveled the world with my guitar. And anytime I brought it out, it, it brings people together. I remember at one conference I was in Spain and uh, giving some talks of the research that I did. And they, they had this music session, this, 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 this platform at this conference. And, and all these musicians who are doctors and researchers would always... Uh, there are a few of us that said, hey, let's let's play. And so we would play. And it was at this moment that I was playing with these people from Spain and Eastern Europe and we're playing this bluesy inspired, um, a very, um, very, uh, very gypsy jazz um, sort of set of songs. And we're just loving it. And at the same time, they're calling me into a presentation because I've won some sort of an award. I said, no, I don't want to go to that. Mm -hmm. Apparently, I won an award for like best presentation at the conference, but I stay there for a minute. Um, anyway, so music has been a, a way to help me to like stay connected and connect with each other. So hence the ta the hence the term reconnection. It is uh, it is it brought me. It has brought. I, whenever I travel, I, I take it with me. I'll whip it out once in a while. Sometimes I'll get, you know, in a restaurant. Uh, when I was younger, they say, "Hey, place a tune," and uh, they would like pay for my dinner. I was like, "Wow, that's crazy. That's awesome." I was in Greece once at another conference and. And uh, I, they saw my guitar and they asked me to play a whole bunch of tunes and it was super fun. And they brought me and my bought me and my colleague our dinner. And um, anyway, so it's not all just about free food for me, although it's nice to get a free free dinner once in a while. But it's, it's about how we connect and how we make sense of the world. Um, here's a ring that I that I have. It's a uh, if you look closely, it's a it's a it's a University of Calgary Dinosaurs National Football championship ring from 1988 and if you were to see the side you'll see my name i uh i um i told you i was tall lanky skinny uncoordinated and uh for me that was, that was like i was like oh man I, I think i can do better um i played basketball and i was like oh it's like getting hurt and falling and and um and uh it was pretty it was, it was still fun and all that stuff but i like i just didn't know my space in, in sport because i thought sport was like something that was really important for me and it, it always has been and uh when i went uh, moved out from my house and moved in with my brother um i i reconnected with sport down there but uh it just felt like the basketball was not super great for me it was hard anyway the um i decided to play uh, football and stayed back there and uh, when I when I joined the football team in uh, in grade eleven, um, one of the and I was like, you know, just learning the ropes. Like I never had a, a, a you know never had a parent bringing me to sports, and I never had a lifetime of it so far. But I was like, I tried hard. I remember this this guy in uh, grade twelve who said, Lindsay, you're not a football player. You should just quit." His name was Monty, and I in my head I like said, "No, that's not that's not that's not how it's going to be." And so because he said, you should quit, I said, absolutely not. I'm going to work even harder. And so uh, I uh, uh, later the next year, I, I mean, that year I took over the starting position. Later that year, I, uh, I won, um, you know, I worked really hard. I was the most outstanding defensive lineman in the league. And I, I went on to play University of Calgary uh, where I started and, and we worked hard and won a national championship. So I'll Seeing the time, I'm going to bring my story to an end. Can I have um, have uh, have the last two slides? Structural inequities. Um, my 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 world. I'll keep going. I'm not going to share the gory stories or the great stories of berries. Um, keep going. There's right there. I'm going to end end with this. The um, the, the things that you experience in life, the things that I've experienced in life has allowed me to understand the nature of those inequities, those hardships that, and where they come from, from colonization, racism and all that stuff. Um, and how people can um, 
make sense of that and move forward in life. My lens as a doctor has been informed by these relationships and these stories of hardships, as well as amazing things that when I come to, to work, when I come to the work that I do in research and in clinic, I, I, I don't see just a biological lens. I see a, a big lens, a big spectrum of things that people are exploring and making sense of. And so my job as a doctor is to often help people to make those very same connections that I've had the privilege of making sense of through, throughout my life understanding those very same hardships that i've experienced that that patient experiences and making those connections with them and i do the same in research so the the role often of a doctor is is not to just be focused on just a certain type of knowledge but knowing that people have an experience and a story and they need support um, what is my role as a doctor? What is my role as a researcher? And what are the roles that you see throughout your life that um, that bring you to this point? For me, it was like the very mundane. I, I, my my amazing story is about the hardships and the and the the sense that I made out of those things, and um, it's those relationships and those those things that were very difficult that I had an opportunity to say, this is not right, and I will learn from it, and I will make change in my own life. Are the things that brought me to medicine and when we look at those those doctors that do amazing things that story is very similar those are the things that we look for in, in doctors are the are not just how well you perform in school which is all connected to a whole bunch of things but that's only like a small portion of how we look at you in getting into 10 percent it's all of those communication skills relationship skills how you deal with adversity how you decision make and it's those day-to-day -day things that are your challenges that you learn from and those are the things that you take with you and become part of your success. And those are the things that we, we think, think make great doctors and researchers. So pay attention to those really mundane challenges, those stories of resistance, stories of reconnection and that survivance, because that's all of our lives. And those are the things that will make you successful. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Croce. That was... Uh... Really, that was so on the mark. I think that everybody, all of these students listening could totally um, glean something from, from those, those, that, those pivotal moments we have where we sort of make a decision to put our foot in the camp of, I'm gonna work hard, I'm gonna try and achieve something, I'm gonna change what's, what's going on right now. Thank you so much. Can't, can't uh, thank you enough for a great start to our day.